you for joining us for KSLA News 12 Now. I'm Brittany Hazelton for Arcletex Artistry. I'm a local um, Shreveport artist and a digital content producer for KSLA. Today we're highlighting an award-winning Arcletex photographer named Deborah Robertson, who reminds us of history and takes us back into the past. Here's an in-depth look at her work, her inspiration, and her process. Well, I've always been interested in photography, and I've visited some beautiful places. Um, I guess it would, I would say that it happened when I went to uh, college. Uh, I went to college in New Hampshire, and if you've ever been uh, to the Northeast, it's a beautiful area, and especially during the fall with the foliage, and you would just be driving down the street, and you would see waterfalls, and so I got a camera. So my first camera was a Pentax K1000 single lens reflex. And um, I loved it. I took pictures everywhere I went. I actually traveled overseas as well. And uh, just whatever caught my eye, I took pictures of it. I've always had an appreciation for nature. I was, you know, the child that would be out in the yard playing. But the only caveat, I didn't like to get dirty. So my mom tells me, that when I would play in the dirt, if I got dirty, then I would come in and take a bath and then go back out again. So, but you know, I, like I said, I just had appreciation for nature. What types of subjects do you play with? Uh, birds and flowers and trees and buildings. You know, uh, I like historical photography that you would capture kind of a, a time period back when. You know, so people can see these things in a new light, uh, and let, and then we won't forget those things. One of one of my uh, well, the beginning of my artist statement is those who don't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. So I just kind of feel like it's upon my shoulders to chronicle, you know, what it was like for African Americans during slavery times, what it was like during uh, antebellum times, what was it like during sharecropping times. So, you know, I, I really like, you know, doing that. I'm not really a person photographer, but I do it, you know, occasionally, uh, especially if it's out in nature. You can get me out in nature. We, we're good. What inspires your work? Um, history. Really, it does. Um, my parents were born and raised on a plantation, and I'm first generation not to. So uh, even though I grew up in Houston, Texas, I would spend all my summers and holidays in Natchitoches. And Natchitoches was a world away from me from Houston. So it was like coming back in time. Uh, I still remember you know, walking down Front Street with my grandparents and a Caucasian couple walked toward us and we had to cross the street and not look in that direction. And that was where they had the good darky up, or some people call it Uncle Jack. Uh, it's a statue that was in the center town of Natchitoches. And it was, we basically took it as, this is how we're supposed to act as African Americans when we come around Caucasian people. So I, I like chronicling that. I, you know, I'm, I think it's important. Like I said about my uh, artist statement, it's important that we know where we came from so that we can know where we want to go. So what kind of equipment do you use? Uh, basically, this is our camera, my spouse and I. And um, it's a Sony A uh, Alpha 6000. I love the Alpha series. They're, they're very um, easy to use, but also give great pictures. Uh, the dynamics of it, you know, you, you can do black and white, you can do color, and it's so sharp. Uh, this is a mirrorless camera, which is a new thing. Uh, if uh, people remember photography back in the day, they had those mirrors in there, and, and if you take the top off of it, you know, and just show it, you can see the mirror flipping up and then flipping back down. 
I actually broke some <laughs> that were mirrorless because you can't drop them. So uh, I really love this camera. And truthfully, how I got back into photography was this camera. My spouse um, basically wanted a camera and she wanted this camera. And so I did some research where I can get it, you know, because it was pretty expensive. So I got it for a, a discount. And then we looked at each other and said, how are we going to use it? So I took a photography class, and the rest is history. Can you explain some of the process? Basically, it's I see something that you know I think may be a good shot. I you know if I'm in a car, you know I I, I get out the car and just start shooting. Um, if I don't have my camera with me, I use my iPhone. Uh, believe it or not. Uh, one teacher told me, she said, you know, these camera, these cell phones have excellent cameras on there. And, you know, when you're in a pinch, of course you can't go to a, a camera shoot with your cell phone. So you want to make sure you have a good uh, quality, you know, camera that you can use besides your cell phone. But, you know, sometimes I use my cell phone. And my process is if I see this great picture, you know, I see it in my mind's eye, I'm going to take it which whatever I have at hand. And I'm, I'm going to sit there and take it and take it and take it until I get the, the, the shot, the one shot. And anybody that's a photographer know that. You know, it's not like get out, take a shot, and you're done. You Sometimes you have to stand there for a while, you know, and wait for the light, you know, especially when you're dealing with outside. You know, you have things like, you know, the weather, uh, cloud coverage, you know, all those things can affect your uh, actual finished product. So there have been times when I've come back to that same spot. And, you know, if it's a clearer day, you know, and I'm like, oh, i got to take this shot, you know. And, like, I have a picture here of the cotton field we're going to look at a little bit later on. Uh, I did that one over a span of days because I wanted the cotton to be, you know, just ripe and, and, and fleshed out and um, the, the lighting to be correct. So, you know, it, it's a process. It, it really is a process. You've just got to be patient and, you know, go for it. And out of that hundreds of shots that you take, you might have that one that's spectacular. All right. Can you tell us about your accomplishments throughout the year? OK. Um, well, I should start with the I graduated high school from Negative Central. And I got into Dartmouth. That was accomplishment number one. Um, so I went to school in New Hampshire. And I uh, studied you know, uh, French. That was one of my uh, core language courses that I had to take. And I've always been interested in French. I took it in high school as well. But Louisiana being Louisiana, I'm like, I have to learn French. Because my grandfather used to speak French to us. And we would laugh because we thought, you know, he was just saying anything off the wall, but he was actually speaking French. So, you know, I, I just kind of like, that's part of my history. So I had to take it. And after I took it, I had a chance to go overseas and stay with a French family. They didn't know any English, and so I was forced to speak French the whole time there. And I had a chance to travel. We had two weeks of travel, and I went to Barcelona. I went to... Uh, other parts of Spain. I went to Italy. I uh, went to Germany. Uh, and all this was during the uh, carnival season. So I had a chance to participate in the, uh, the different parades, you know, kind of like what we do here in Mardi Gras. They have their own version. So um, that really, you know, prompted me. I have pictures that I, you know, took, you know, from there as well. I ended up working for Continental Airlines. And uh, from there, I went to Dartmouth Travel and, you know, was able to travel as much as I want, anywhere I wanted to go. When I got settled here, I did IT for about, uh, about 30 years, and I decided no more. I, I don't want to go under desks and, you know, fix computers. So I went back to school, and I went to BIPC, and that was the best choice I could ever make. You know, some people look at uh, community colleges and they turn down their nose. But here you got someone from Dartmouth, you know, having the accolades for BIPC, a wonderful program, communications. 
And um, I, I just bloomed in, in the classes that I took. And I took all the classes I wanted. And um, photography was one of them. Learned how to use this camera thanks to Jennifer Robinson. And she actually, when I submitted my uh, body of work at the end, she said, your work belongs in a museum. And I told her she spoke it into my life because here it is. You know, I actually won critical mass. That was a big accomplishment uh, last year in uh, visual. And so, you know, I'm very happy. Uh, I've been able to go from different places and, you know, be able to show my, my work, you know, in, in different places. And I look forward to it actually going outside of Louisiana. Eventually, I have two pieces that I want to, to get into the African American Museum in DC. Uh, what I would tell them is never too late. Because like I said, I had a whole career uh, before I actually became professional. And I just took it one step at a time. You know, if you're interested in getting photography and you're like, how do I start? Take a class. You know, there are classes at these community colleges, wherever you are, whether you want to go to Bipsy or, you know, some other place, uh, start with a class and you'll learn the fundamentals of, you know, how to hold the camera, how to do studio uh, shots, how to work with, you know, your camera outside in the elements, you know, basically being able to focus in and focus out and, you know, depending on what kind of shot, because sometimes you have these off shots that, you know, become amazing. So that would be the advice I would give them. It's never too late and take a class. Yes, I have actually three pictures here that are kind of related. Um, this picture here is my mom's hands that's full of uh, cotton in its original form when you actually pull it out of the cotton field. And the reason why I did this is because uh, my mom picked cotton. Like I said, she was born and raised on the plantation. And so that was their main uh, body of work, main work that they did was picking cotton. Uh, they also had sugar cane that they would do as well, but that most of the, the women would uh, pick cotton as well as the men and the children. Uh, so that's why I did this. This was kind of an ode to her past life. And for us to remember that, you know, that's, that's where African Americans started work in the fields. Uh, the next picture here, this is called um, Cotton Field, The Overseer. And I actually wrote uh, a piece on that of, uh, in my book that's called Cane River Chronicles that was uh, really the precursor to this exhibit. This piece is a cotton field and it's actually on Highway 1 in Natchitoches. And if you're familiar with Natchitoches, Highway 1 will lead you to uh, Natchez. And Natchez is the area, not Natchez, Mississippi, Natchez, Louisiana. It's an area where pretty much all the plantations were. Uh, so that's where, you know, we go down that uh, Highway 1 and we uh, can see different plantations that are still up now. Um, and um, I was able to capture this picture of the cotton field. Now, this was not a one-shot deal. I actually had to come back several days until I got the actual picture that I used here. And in choosing, you know, your pictures, the framing is as important as the picture itself. So I wanted one of these that was kind of aged and I took some cotton that I picked uh, off of uh, one of the uh, fields, not this actual field here. Um, and I put it at the bottom with a whip. And the reason why I have the whip is because back during slavery times, uh, they would, they were expected to pick a certain amount of cotton. They would expect to do it expediently, not, you know, taking their time. So if you had someone that was a little slow, you know, the overseer would crack that whip and that was your, you know, key to speed it up. And this last piece over here, uh, this is actually uh, a bag made of cotton. And um, that's what they used when they would uh, go in the fields. And you see, there's a little bit of cotton here that I actually bought with me and put in this uh, sack. This sack actually belongs to Sumas. 
Um, but they had to fill that sack. And if you take a look at it, I mean, some of it is folded up at the bottom. That's a pretty big sack. And they were actually expected to fill that sack during each day that they were in the uh, plantations on the uh, cotton field. So that was not, you know, fill a sack in a week, that was fill a sack in a day. So that's, uh, yeah, that's why I have all three of these pieces uh, that are set together, because it's a reminder of where African Americans came from and to where we are now. All right, this picture is another picture that is really significant. This is St. Matthew Baptist Church. And the reason why uh, I chose to talk about this piece is because it's on the National Historic Registry. Uh, this was the only Protestant church, black church, that slaves could go to and that people that were sharecroppers could go to. It was also a one-room schoolhouse. So this is where a lot of uh, African-American children started out. Um, they would go up until sixth grade, and the significance of sixth grade is uh, there was a law that you could vote, this was before uh, civil rights, that uh, African Americans could vote if they had a sixth grade education. And that was few and far between. Not many people were able to attain a sixth grade education because they were required to work in the field. But the few that did make it to sixth grade had the opportunity to vote, but that was later rescinded by the government. So this church is still standing, it's still functional, and you see the uh, bell. The bell would ring for two reasons, uh, the beginning of the school day and the beginning of church, actually three reasons, and then when there was a funeral. And actually, a little bit off to this, this, this uh, land is pretty long. Uh, there's a cemetery, and in, in that cemetery, St. Matthew Cemetery, uh, a lot of my ancestors are buried there because, you know, like I said, there weren't, you, you didn't have places, you know, where you could just go anywhere and bury somebody. So a lot of these old churches had cemeteries, you know, attached to them because they needed to have places to bury their, you know, uh, parishioners. So um, this church now is uh, a working church, like I said, a little bit over to the side, they actually got a grant at some point in the 70s to build a K through 12 uh, school. So a lot of people graduated from St. Matthew uh, High School is what it was called. My mom and my aunts and you know my cousins behind that. And I believe that it was uh, early 80s when it closed. Uh, so we have a, lot, a significant amount of people that came through and went to St. Matthew High School. So like I said, that church is still operational. The school is not. Uh, most people now go to Nagata Central High School, which is where I graduated. But the precursor to Nagata Central High School was St. Matthew High School. For more in-depth content and extended interviews, please re head to our website or app and click News 12 Now.